Kia ora koutou. Welcome to the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare being held in Amsterdam and Holland. My name is Lindsay Bartlett and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Jan Adams from Waikato District Health Board for organising and coordinating at distance um, this panel discussion today. The topic for today's discussion is on system redesign and transformation. It is both my privilege and pre pleasure to introduce our panellists today. First of all is Mr Jim Easton. Jim is the, director, is the National Director for Improvement and Efficiency in UK. We have Dr Pedro Delgado, who is the Executive Director from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in the USA. And our final panellist today is Dr Lynn Ma, who is the Interim Director for Innovation, NHS Institution for in Innovation and Improvement in England. New Zealand for some time now has been improving its systems and um, working very hard to both at a national and at a local level um, improve healthcare service and delivery. That change over time has been incremental however. The current environment that we're working in is making it more difficult to continue with incremental change which is a little bit slow for the, for the rate of change that's actually required in the current environment. Financial drivers, no different from the global experience. The increase in demand, not only in numbers, but in expectations from the populations, and also um, the complexity of the demand that is facing the health services now. New Zealand now needs to rethink probably how it does that and we'd like the opportunity to learn from the panellists as to the sorts of things that you have also been working on. The first of our questions today is, where do you start? And I'm very aware that the, UA, the UK's NHS has been doing a lot of this um, up until now. So from your experience, can you give us some insights as to where do you start and how do you go about leaping off on the idea of complete redesign of your health system? Well, it's, it's great, uh, Lindsay, to be here. And we've looked with a lot of admiration at the work colleagues have done in uh, New Zealand. It's been a very similar journey to ours in the uh, uh, in England where we've gained huge benefits from uh, improvement and redesign led by colleagues like uh, Lynn but it's become clear to us exactly as you say that the the rate of change isn't sufficient particularly as we're facing um, both a, a, a quality challenge that we welcome how do we tackle the issues of safety but we've been landed with a significant financial problem and effectively we have to deliver better quality from a budget that's going to stay flat and for us that's created a huge driver to change or die, uh, really. Um, we did start, though, with where we were. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot in what we've done um, that we need to sustain. Um, you know, our basic game plan is built on continuing and accelerating the quality improvement skills that we've got. It's not a U-turn, it's a, an acceleration. Um, and my particular focus is how do you take that great improvement work, redesign of emergency services, of uh, cancer care, uh, innovation work. How do you take that and create an environment which is more likely to accelerate it? And I've become increasingly obsessed with a whole series of things uh, around the way you change the whole um, kind of the way money flows in the system, how we reward the kind of care that we want instead of the care that reflects yesterday, how we change leadership development to develop uh, leaders throughout the system, clinical, managerial, at the top, in the middle, at the front line, who are capable of uh, making this change, how we change the planning system so that people are focused on recognizing their job, is it, they're doing their job well if they deliver quality and um, uh, economic, uh, uh, economic gain. In other words, just thinking about the whole set of levers, whether you're working at a national level, in a local hospital, in a local community, what are the levers under your hand? And instead of running improvement as some kind of important but slightly side issue, how do you align all of those levers, all the things that make stuff happen in your country and mine, to all drive for the same thing? And that's really what our focus has been on. Thank you. Anybody else want to make any comment? No? I, I, I think Jim's um, uh, statement of, of the different levers in the system is exactly right. And I think for frontline staff particularly, it's about them feeling confident and enabled and tooled up to be able to do this from their perspective. Because certainly in both countries, in terms of the frontline staff, they're the mass who are going to, you know, uprise really to help that happen. 
And I suppose that's one of our one of our key challenges is that engagement, um, not only of our clinical staff but also of our, our communities and our populations, um, and trying to move them forward that this is in fact a direction we want to move on and perhaps Pedro you might like to comment on the best ways of engaging clinical staff and um, particularly our medical colleagues in being champions for the types of change that we are looking at. Yeah I'll start with three thoughts and, and, and just to add to the last question uh, there's a phrase that I love for framing this issue that we all have which is transformation happens all the time but start before you're ready so there's never a perfect time for these things and, and we're all in the same boat in whatever we're we're doing in in, re in relation to engaging clinicians I, I would offer a, a framing again which is useful in terms of thinking about engaging patients so it's it's three it has three elements one is doing two so are you doing to them one is doing four are you working with them to do it and one is doing with which, which conveys a sense of partnership. So thinking through those three things and trying to evaluate where you are and how you're framing those relationships, I think, is useful. The other one is in relation to data, and it's, it's an issue that I know Jim and Lynn deal with hugely in the UK. So generate, generate light, not heat. So how do you use the data for accountability? How do you use the data for improvement? And, and, and when do you do that? When's the right time to use it for uh, and the third thing is, is this issue of, of uh, ensuring that regardless of the power struggles in relation to the clinician group and whatever administrations called in the U.S. or managerial chains, is to ensure that there's a, an open line of communication where there's transparency. So I'll give you an example from Mayo Clinic where Bill Robb brings people who continuously resist change and sits them down across the table and asks the question pretty openly. So what's the alternative? I'm offering this for the organization, it's aligned with purpose, with your principles and so on. You seem to have a better alternative, I'd love to hear what it is. And I'd love to learn, because we need to learn from, from people. And that, engage, that changes the conversation, because uh, of the transparency, because of the, 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 the natural state that that, that conveys. So. I mean, they're great, they're great points, and um, I love that example of the Mayo, because engagement, particularly with clinical colleagues, is a contact sport. You know, it doesn't happen by email or um, uh, newsletters. Those things might be useful, but it happens kind of pretty much one-to-one -one, um, or in small groups. And, you know, when you're leading change, you just have to create the time to do it. And it, it, it seems kind of really expensive in terms of the time you want to spend, but you, you absolutely have to do it. Uh, and, and you're not leading change if you're not spending a really significant slice of your time in corridors, in the operating theatre, where people are, having exactly those debates around uh, purpose and um, where you go. And then you need to differentiate, I think, again, as Pedro was saying, and there's no problem finding champions. You know, in your system, they'll be fantastic. I mean, you couldn't stop them if you tried. They'll be, they'll be doing stuff. The real effort is around the, the kind of diffusion curve and helping bridge to those people who are looking slightly nervously at what's happening and kind of making a connection with those and having a strategy for those who actively resist. Although I think one of the great risks of leading change is having too much of your time sucked towards the really negative people, but more thinking about working through the diffusion um, curve. So we're, we're trying to do this thing called a massive engagement program where we're trying to um, engage literally tens of thousands of, um, of people, which is a huge effort. And we did that fairly traditionally at first with all sorts of engagement events. What we're moving on to now, which my colleague, who I know many people in New Zealand know, Helen Bevan, is leading and, and would be really worth making contact with, is trying to use a specific techniques of political campaigning, you know, the way that the Obama election campaign was run, for instance, to create much more energised networks of leaders rather than having to push communication out all the time. And we think those skills of harnessing um, a campaigning approach to bring people on board are great. Having said all that, this stuff is difficult. It challenges interests, yes. you know, and, you know, uh, you will get people who are not opposed to change. They're just opposed to losing status, symbols of their um, kind of success. And it, even done well, it's a complicated and occasionally tough journey. Let me offer a bit of humor, just because he mentioned contact sports and it's just an easy win here. You guys have the Rugby World Cup coming up. <laughs> 
And I wonder from an hacker before every exactly before for, every or from an incentive point of view, you know how creative you can be with the rugby World Cup and what that's going to bring with some other resistant yeah. clinicians. I just think starting every <laughs> clinical meeting with a hacker would be fantastic. <laughs> Set the tone. Well, we do use Pohiri and um, Karakia quite well, which is prayer and um, the the use of welcome and song. Um, uh, uh, throughout New Zealand so yeah it, it does engage them in the partnership stuff um, not necessarily changes the clinical view um, and things like that and part of the the next part of that question is also the engagement of communities you mentioned before the emergency department and the challenges of emergency departments how do have you got any clues or any quick tips on engaging communities and getting them to participate in some of the d redesign or some of the changes that are necessary having patients rock up to ED um, as its primary care service is not particularly helpful um, and it doesn't sustain them in the long term but how do we engage the, pa the, the patients, the community in actually affecting some of the changes that we're looking to do? Um, we've been doing a lot of work on, on that, Lindsay, in, in our work that we describe as um, experience-based design. And I think the fundamental thing is that communities and patients want to be engaged. And typically, in our system, we have had this relationship where, where you know, where the clinicians and, and managers and we perhaps know slightly better about health services. But through this work, uh, we've been able to identify with patients patients what, and their family members exactly what is their experience. Why is it that they go to the emergency room rather than see their family doctor? What are the real sticking points? So that then through those experiences we can understand uh, their process and get insights to work with them about how to make that better. And we're doing a lot of work around that now, both with patients, family members and their family doctors and in relation to emergency care because our, our rates of people trying to access emergency care have gone up. What we're finding is many patients and family members are confused about where they should go. It's not clear when the family doctor is open, what they should access care there from, how, you know, what else is available. So the communication that has been written typically by professionals is not clear when read by other people. And that's given us really great insight into, you know, the patients and family members helping us to write that information, for example. And, you know, what we found is through this co-design, as we call it, the patients and family members are identifying waste, they're identifying points in the process that the clinicians feel were helpful, but the patients and family members are saying, Oh, we don't know why that's there, we don't need it. And so we're able to streamline services, take waste out of the services, and increase quality, safety while reducing cost. It's an untapped resource. Mm. Lynn's work on engaging patients is uh, absolutely fantastic and I commend it to anyone in terms of just building it into redesign. Yeah. It's just top quality work. Yeah. But the hard truth for us on emergency care was that we started thinking patients were wrong and we just needed to kind of get them sorted. Turns out they're making entirely rational decisions. And it's, it's as Lynn says, our emergency care system is confusing. Um, particularly when we've been through a period of growth, we kind of overlapped, um, you know, actually massively improving our emergency department. So you now get seen really quickly in high quality. New arrangements in out of hours care for primary care. We've introduced all sorts of other bits of services in communities. And you can't expect people sitting in their homes with a child with a raging temperature to do anything other than make a rational decision, which is what's the quickest point of access to high quality care. Mm. So it turns out the patients are right. They're making rational decisions against a confused background. So in addition to involving them, we've had to face some hard questions about pretty fundamentally stepping back and thinking about our pattern of services. And one of the things we're doing is, um, uh, and forgive me, you may, you may have done this um, already, is introducing a new non-emergency telephone number, 111, across the country. Um, which, uh, and I spent some time with one of the pilot sites last week, which uh, uh, not only do you ring and they kind of, you know, say my child's got this raging temperature, 
Uh, they don't just say, well, you need to see a GP. They'll say, we can arrange transport for you to get you to the out-of-hours centre. It'll be there in 15 minutes. And make it work from the patient's point of view. Instead of expecting our patients to navigate their way through a ridiculously confusing system, and they are right in the face of that, to escalate to the nearest point of safety. So I'm afraid we had to take a hard look at what we created and realise that it was us who were the problem and our patients who were rational, not us. I need to clarify, 111 in New Zealand is our emergency line. Okay, <laughs> so 111, uh, so uh, yeah. we have an 0800 number, um, but the, the telephone triage doesn't go as far yeah, so as what had, you're talking about. So is we had, we had an HS step. Direct, which is exactly yes. the same, and mm. they'd give you advice, yes. and the advice might say, you need to see the doctor in the next 24 hours. But, not but not if you go back and your child is you know, not very well or your mum still seems poorly, you'll put that person in a car and you'll take them to the ED. Yeah. You have to, it's, it's beyond advice, you have to provide services. Service. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Leading on from that, you know, you get started, you start moving on. Countries around the world have been doing this for some time. Are there examples of really good systems? Are there examples, um, are there champions that we can be looking to? And how will we know we've got there? What will, what will the good health system actually look like? Pedro. Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a complicated question. And we tend to go to the same examples all the time. So we mentioned junk shipping County in Sweden. We mentioned some of the elements of Tayside. We mentioned the Kaiser Permanentes of this world. I'm going to offer one, one example just from a, from a non-traditional setting um, in Mexico. Uh, Enrique Reles is a, is a Surgeon General of Mexico, the General Secretary for the Department of Health. And when he was leading quality for the country, he started a, a group of citizens uh, and, and, and an exercise through them of accrediting healthcare sites. So this, this was his idea of sustainability, that if you give it to the population, it will, sustain, it will be sustained over time because it's not dependent on who's in charge or when it happens or how it happens. There's a process, they lead it, they own it, and they drive it. So this, this was called citizen endorsement strategy. They, they go with a checklist to a healthcare facility where they're not patients. This is a small group of citizens. They might be associated with a community or with a university. They go to a facility, they assess the facility themselves, they, they create a list of things that the director of the facility needs to do, the director signs a letter of commitment to do those things and a commitment to meet them 90 days later, and they come and visit the director 90 days later. This gets fed back to the, to the central government and so on, but it's driven by the citizens. They started with a few groups. It grew to over 2,000 groups throughout Mexico, and it's sustainable. They started in 2004, and nowadays there's still over 1,000 of those groups still alive, even though Enrique has moved on from the quality. So citizen endorsement, how do you drive sustainability through citizen ownership of the change as opposed to the change depending on resources on or a big decision or on a person or an individual? This is citizen-driven care, which is where we're all moving towards. How do, how do we make it? How do, how do we ask them to help us shape the system as opposed to feeling that we always have to be the ones with the answers. Has that been useful in also um, reducing health disparity? Because that's a key issue for New Zealand, the, the disparity in populations, our Māori health population versus our non-Māori populations and things like that. Are you able to comment at all whether that's it's impacted had some, on that? It's had some effect. I, I don't think I could tell you, I could, tell you, I could give you any, any uh, facts beyond the f fact the idea that these things are still alive and some of the issues raised and some of the dimensions under the we they evaluate the centers are things like access which directly impact uh, equity and so on. And certainly the, the patient experience work um, is perfect for that because sometimes there's a disparity because we don't understand you know, from a clinical or managerial um, perspective. And it's just like Jim says, people make rational decisions based on what they, they understand. So patients and family members will, will act in a way that they understand. If we spent time, under, you know, getting their stories, uh, hearing about what is easy for them, what is difficult, what they need to help them, um, then it can unlock the develop development of new processes where, for example, people who were not accessing, accessing care until they were really, really ill suddenly 
can be able to access care because they understand it and we understand what they need and and that that saves it saves heartbreak if somebody's really really unwell and it saves money because they're accessing care earlier which is usually not as costly as accessing you know emergency care at the last minute when you need an operation can I say something about this um, sort of exemplar sites? It's a really interesting problem, and, and the examples Pedro quotes are fantastic and they are inspirational. But when I've, when I've sort of, you know, visited Kaiser or whatever, I have two experiences. Firstly, I'm very inspired, but I also feel a bit overwhelmed. Because the question is, well, how on earth do I go from where I am to where these, where these people are? And um, particularly as their journey is usually a decade-long journey. They didn't wake up one morning and become health partners or Kaiser Permanente or Tayside, they went on a quite a long journey. And so I think it's, it's a fantastically useful thing to do. Um, but when I've, when I've done it, I've tried to have two things in my mind. First of all, to understand the journey and to understand that, you know, what were the early steps that you can take that move you uh, along that way. And then to be clear, I mean, you can't replicate things from one country to another. The key thing is what are the key the key things, and I think they're, I mean, they're very interesting in colleagues' views. I suspect they're things like uh, continuity of purpose in leadership, you know, what, what clarity about what it was people trying to achieve. So one of the, if, if the issue is health inequity, if that's our driving issue, how do we hold on to that for the next decade to, to drive? But having a change method and using it, it's not particularly whether it's lean or something else, but to have a change method for it to become the kind of lifeblood of the organisation and to continue to use, uh, use that with kind of continuity of purpose. Um, to kind of do the stuff we were talking about earlier about just relentless engagement of people in that, in that journey. Um, and have clear goals, you know, clear shared goals and kind of have those grow incrementally. So, you know, you can't become one of those things overnight, but I think you can understand the kind of place along the journey. Otherwise, for me, it just be, I just get on the plane on the way back and think, well, I, can't, I don't know how to get there in uh, South London or something. You know. so, so let me offer a, a document which contains Jim's great summary of, of the elements. Uh, on the way up to this meeting right now, I, I, I enter the lift with somebody called Anthony Steins. He's a researcher from Switzerland who's done brilliant work. So he went to Kaiser, he went to Jong Shipping, he went to the VA, he went to five systems that he thought through feedback from leaders throughout the world were the top five in the world. And he looked at them deeply and he came up with a pretty interesting framework in relation to what's needed. And, and the journey takes 10 years. That's his, part of his theory. Mm -hmm. There's an investment threshold. So you spend 10 years dragging along and trying to figure it out. And after 10 years, there seems to be a, 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 a takeoff where everything sort of comes together. That seems to be the, the tipping point where everything seems to come together. But his work, Anthony Staines, is a wonderful piece of work. I'm sure if, you, if people in New Zealand can get access to that through the internet, I mean, he has many presentations from past forums uh, that, that would be stored there for free. That's a great reference. Uh, and another example would be um, we, Paul Plisek, who many people know. Yes. Um, has just done a big piece of work for us on the key principles of large-scale change and that's about to be literally yeah, about to be published to be. and I think again that will be a really good reference for people trying to think through these issues. Were the conclusions the same as mine or were they different? Completely, <laughs> completely. He, he, yeah, he had the advantage I should have of published. paper <laughs> and of a graph and, and he, he put it beautifully but it was, it was basically Jim's theory of change on paper backed by yeah. a five-year journey of research. So. And, and our work on a large-scale change that um, Paul Plesett was the um, director of an academy for large-scale change where we got lots of people together. There is a model, but it picks up on all of the things that we've been saying. There's leadership attention, there's levers in the higher policy system as enablers. Um, there's working to help people understand where we're trying to get to over time. Achievement, helping people to achieve some early wins so that they maintain enthusiasm um, while recognising this is not a week-long journey, this is a 10-year journey. And through that journey, people will get confident and, and be skilled to achieve that. And some of it is about translating what needs to happen as we articulate it at a national level. For example, 
you know, we, we, we need to reduce our costs by X billion. To what, what does that mean to me as a staff nurse on the ward? Because 20 billion, I, I can't do that. It's, you know, Jim's saying he's gone to Kaiser. But if we say, okay, for you, we could work this out roughly, and it might be 2,000 pounds. What could you do in terms of reducing waste or being more efficient? And suddenly, people say, I, I can do that. I, I, can, I can contribute here. So, so it's really important to have leadership. But for me, a, a critical factor is translation to what that means to our workforce, who are the people who, who we rely on to deliver this. You know? so, so making sure they understand and they're able. It's been very, very useful. It's, it's also answered the final question, which was run around the concept of change fatigue and what you're saying is change fatigue is not something you should be addressing if you're addressing the fact that this is a 10-year journey. Just man it's up. going to take yeah, It's going to take time and, and to get used to it. This is where we have to go. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. It would be great to continue the conversations for much, much longer. Um, so I'd just like to thank you again on thank behalf you. of New Zealand and, um, and we will take your advice on board and, um, and use it to improve our systems. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Keep, Keep doing on. the great work you're doing. Yeah. Thank you.